Good morning. As I continue to read through and study the book of Romans, you know, one of the, the idea that's really been central to the last couple of weeks has been the Christian hope. And Paul calls it the hope of the glory of God. And the glory of God being this all-encompassing nature and character of him that's eternal and also very good, and it's the exact opposite of tribulations and sufferings. So uh, whatever it is, it's, it's going to be really awesome. Chapter 8, he really breaks down a little bit more what it is, but, you know, this hope, as he calls it, and, the, and as the Bible uses it, it's a word that means a confident expectation. There is a, there's a, uh, a certainty to it. It isn't a, a thing that is a potential or, uh, you know, something you just want, but there's, you know, maybe a little bit of uncertainty associated with it. The idea is that a Christian, when he has hope, is, is absolutely assured and confident in every waking moment without a sh- the shadow of a doubt That if they were to die right now, right into the presence of God in paradise, they would go. And, and, you know, that I, the idea of that is something that is hard for a nat, you know, a society that's born, uh, nowadays, um, in naturalism and, you know, naturalistic philosophies and everything is physical. It's really hard to have such a confident expectation of a thing you've never even seen before. And, if you go, you know, if you study in the New Testament, or if you study, excuse me, in the book of Romans, there are, we've, we've looked at a couple of them, or we've, we've really looked at uh, one of them and one of them by like uh, a passing mention. But as I go through Romans, I think there's three means to greater hope that Paul provides. And the one that we looked at last week is where in Romans chapter 5 and verse 3, he says not only... That, but we boast in our afflictions. Why do we boast in afflictions and tribulation and suffering? Well, knowing that affliction produces endurance. Endurance, proven character, and proven character, hope. So, according to Romans 5, 3, we gain a greater hope when by faith we endure afflictions, which brings about endurance, which creates a proven character, which in that state of proven character, you have the development of hope that you didn't have before. So hope comes, really oddly enough, through situations that make us feel hopeless. And that was Paul's instruction of how to grow in hope, is through afflictions and having a proper mindset through it. Another means to greater hope, the second one, is in Romans 15 and verse 4, when Paul says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So through the encouragement of the scriptures and these things that were written in former days, he's saying that's how you get a bigger hope. You know, if you're, if you're going about in this world today where it seems as though so many institutions and so many parts of life and the fabric of society that we have taken for granted for so many years are just falling apart, And it can make you feel hopeless. Well, he says, get into the scriptures. If you want to feel hopeless, get into the media. If you want to be filled with hope, get into the scriptures. You know, it it has to do with the things we're filling our minds with. Well, we have this record of people having endured far worse things than you and I are enduring. And yet they maintained faithfulness to God because they desired what was ahead of them. You read about that kind of stuff and it gives you a greater hope. We learn from their hopefulness in the midst of their hopeless situations. So that's what Paul says is the second means to greater hope. Excuse me. But the third one in Romans 15 and verse 13, he says, May the God of hope, that's who he is, may he fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So... According to that, and I've mentioned that passage the last two weeks in a row. It was little more than a passing mention, but there was a mention of it intentionally because that's kind of the the idea we're going to be settling into this morning. 
But Paul is saying hope is a thing that actually comes from God and it is actually something that you attain and that you gain by the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It isn't a thing that you can uh, uh, muster up by way of your, uh, your own faculties. It isn't a thing you can produce with your uh, personal character or uh, even if you had a great will to produce hope on your own, naturally, you couldn't. Because he's saying it's a thing of God that is, that is by way of the power of the Holy Spirit. And what he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, settles into that idea of, of how hope is connected to the Holy Spirit in an extremely profound way. And I have to say that, you know, as we're going through Romans and, uh, and I'm presenting these things, these are things very often that I'm learning for the first time as I, as for the first time in my life, I've been able to dedicate, you know, a, a many hours through the week to, a, to one or two sentences. I've, you can't do that with every single Bible verse, uh, you know, by this age in my life. So I'm learning all of these things, maybe not all of them, but I'm learning a lot of them with you all. And this letter is so rich. I, I hope you're enjoying this in the same way that I am, because it's going to build and develop a deeper and more robust faith in God. And uh, uh, that's just going to give more confidence in what's to come. We have really good things to come. And we need to have hope. Christians need to have hope to maintain faithfulness. If you do not have any hope, you will not be faithful. So we want to be hopeful, don't we? So this is about how do I get, you know, to where my expectation isn't uh, uh, either an unknown, which it is sometimes for some people. It's an unknown. I have no idea what's on the other side of the veil of life. When I pass through this life to the next, I don't know what's on the other side. That's a lot of people. It's ignorance. They have no idea. Some people have a looming expectation of judgment, and they know on the other side of this life, there's hell waiting for me because I know how I've lived, and I know I ought not live that way, but I continue to do it anyways. And so they have this expectation of that, and they're going to, like those demons in the Gospel of Matthew, say, have you come to judge us before the time as they're tormenting that man? And Jesus said, get out of him, put him in the pigs, and they ran off the, the cliff. Those demons knew that a time of judgment was coming, and yet they continued to live in it because they thought... This is all there is. Well, we as Christians have not, e we don't have ignorance as to what's on the other side, and we ought not have an expectation of judgment as to what's on the other side, because uh, the Christian is to be filled up with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to get into some things this morning that I truly think are, are life altering uh, if you pay attention. So I ask that you please do, um, no matter how long I decide to preach. Please do tune in, because these are, these are things that as I was breaking open this week, I, I thought, why is this something that isn't preached on? And the only thing I could think is, well, I've never preached on it. But it's because before this week, I don't think I understood it. And uh, I, I maybe understood it in a passing way, but being able to explain it by, by an actual argument that Paul is making that's like, when you look at it, it's like, well, that is actually what he's saying. I don't think I ever knew that before this week. And when you have an argument, a scriptural argument, the Bible is full of arguments. That's why you have for and therefore and because and, and uh, so. That's why you have all those things, because the Bible's making arguments he makes, they, they put out statements, they say this, this, and this, and they say, therefore, this. They're always making arguments. Well, Paul is doing that this morning concerning something related to our hope. And uh, so I want you to read with me in Romans 5. I'm gonna, for context, we'll start where we started last week in verse 3, and we'll read through verse 5. So Romans 5, beginning in verse 3, he says, And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Hmm. We rejoice in our hope of the glory of God. More than that, or not only that, but we rejoice in afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance. 
Endurance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Why? Because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Paul is setting up an argument by way of something in the past. He uses the aorist tense at the end of verse 5. Holy Spirit who was given to us. He sets up an argument based off of something that happened at a definite point in time somewhere on the chronological timeline before today for those who fit into the context of what he's talking about, which is believers. And by way of having been given something back then, he makes a present tense reality for them, which is summed up in the the phrase, hope does not disappoint. Now, I said it already, but go back in your grade school years to when you had to parse sentences. Maybe they didn't use the word parse, where you had to diagram sentences, and you had to find the, you know, the, the verbs and the, the, the main noun and, and all of that, and you learned tenses. We don't talk about tenses. We don't read the Bible and stop and think, Why did he use that tense as opposed to another one? But what tense does Paul say concerning this hope right now relating to disappointing or not disappointing us? He says, look at it again, verse 5, and hope does not disappoint us. What tense is does? That's present. This is now, and and I I spent a lot of time reflecting over that because I thought the argument, you know, you I I would think my expectation would be that Paul would say hope will not disappoint you. In other words, keep waiting until you get to the other side of the veil, and I promise you it won't disappoint you. But he doesn't say that. He says right now, presently, hope doesn't disappoint you. In other words, he's saying there is a reality that is true and, and, and um, real for Christians who have the faith that we talked about in Romans chapter 4, who right now, today, are presently not disappointed by a hope which they've not even seen. Now remember, if you go back two weeks ago, Hope that is, who hopes for what he sees? Isn't that what Paul said? He said, who hopes for what he sees? If it's something you've seen, it isn't hope, but we hope for what we do not see. In other words, Paul is saying right now, presently in Jesus Christ, we shouldn't be disappointed concerning something that we haven't yet seen. That's a big statement, and it, and, it, and it merits a really big why. Or how so? How is it that right now, presently, I, I'm not disappointed of a thing that's in the future that I've not experienced, nor has a single person that I know that I can talk to and relate to me? I know lots of people that crossed over the veil. Haven't been able to talk to any of them. I don't know what they're doing over there. All we have is the land of the living. We don't have access to what's beyond. So, so just, just get that before you. Paul is saying the Christian hope right now, presently, should be a sure thing. It's the opposite of it being disappointing. Well... Why? Well, he says why. He actually answers the question for the person who's asking. Because right after he says, this hope does not disappoint us, he says, because. Here's why. Because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. In other words, he equates God's love to the gift of the Holy Spirit, which he says was given to those who are believers. So 
Presently, I'm not hopeless. Presently, I'm very hopeful. Presently, I'm assured and confident of my hope because the Holy Spirit was given to me. So for the person who's, and we're going to get into that for in, in a second, but first, before we move on, you have to understand that Paul's argument is for the person who may have prior to this point been hopeless or, or whatever, he's saying a, a person should be totally certain in what is unknown ahead of them because of a present reality now, namely the Holy Spirit. Because you have the Holy Spirit within you, you should be totally assured and totally confident of the things that you've not yet seen. So I asked all week about this. And maybe this is your question. It, it should be. How, how in the world is the presence of an invisible spirit to be my confidence of an invisible reality? That's what Paul's saying. You should, be, you should be totally certain of that thing you haven't seen because of that thing in you that you haven't seen. How, how does that work? What's his point? Well, the implication is that something of the Holy Spirit beyond his invisibility should be perceived. The point of Paul, it wouldn't make any sense to say you should be confident of something you haven't seen because of something else that you haven't seen. It doesn't make any sense. Because he says the love of God has been poured into us by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. In other words, the Christian is going to be reading and being like, I do have the Holy Spirit, that's true. And, and by, by way of having this Holy Spirit within me, I, I'm absolutely certain and know undoubtedly that, that, that heaven is on the other side. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to have this Holy Spirit. But, you know, we, we kind of, we struggle with that a little bit because we teach so either we don't teach anything at all or we try to stand away from it for fear of being charismatic or we just don't even talk about the Holy Spirit because we think, yeah, I don't get it. I don't know what that thing is. And, you know, it's, he's a part of the Godhead somehow in some way. But beyond that, we don't really know. And uh, there's just this. Um, there's a lot of ignorance that's associated with it. And we, we try to stay away from it because it seems like a slippery concept that can get away from us. But, but Paul's building a really big argument on top of it, which demands that we understand exactly what he's saying. Do, do you see why I'm saying you can't say to somebody, you should be certain of that thing you don't see because of this thing over here that you don't see? Like, you know, if Judas said, Dad, there's a monster behind you, okay? Well, I don't see it. Well, my imaginary friend Joe said that this monster is behind you. Okay, well, that doesn't, that doesn't clarify anything, and it doesn't help me see it any differently. Do you see how, Paul's, by, by virtue of Paul's argument, he's demanding that there be something of the Holy Spirit that's perceived? Beyond his invisibility, he's building a case about the Holy Spirit that is separate and apart from him being invisible. He's saying, apart from him being invisible, you should be confident of his presence. And this wouldn't be the first time in the letter to the Romans where Paul talked about something that was, do you remember this line from 29 weeks ago? That is invisible, but inexcusably perceivable. Do you remember that line? 29 weeks ago, you probably don't even remember last week. 29 weeks ago, give or take, we were in Romans chapter 1 and we read this verse. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes. <laughs> plain, shown, and then the first argument that he makes is what is the invisible things of God. For his invisible attributes, namely 
his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that they've been made. So they are without excuse when they get to judgment day and say, I never saw you, I never heard your voice, and therefore I did not have to believe you and I lived recklessly. And he would say they were invisible, but they were inexcusably perceivable because I made them plain to you and I showed them to you. In other words, when you went out into the world, you never saw God, but everywhere you look, you saw the effects of God. And there was something within you called reason that God put into your, into your mind that should have concluded. There's just no way that these complex organism, organisms and structures and cells, when you, you know, even now today we're looking at them, they didn't even have access to a microscope. But the deeper we get, the more complex it is. And you shouldn't have thought that something that infinite in complexity that even with the best resources we have we can't even begin to grasp it that those things just happened by chance and came from absolutely nothing when you know within your reason that things don't come from nothing so he is the point is yes god's invisible but he's very perceivable because you see his effects everywhere so that's the big idea of what he said there invisible but inexcusably perceivable and this is what Paul is talking about here in uh, this argument in chapter 5 where he says the hope, uh, you know, it, he said it later. He says the hope isn't yet seen. You, you've not seen it. Has anybody here seen paradise yet? No. You haven't seen it yet. Because he says who hopes for what he sees? But you're totally confident of it. And he says it doesn't disappoint you right now. Why not? Because you have the Spirit in you. And if all the Holy Spirit did within you was be invisible, then that argument doesn't make sense. Do we get that? In uh, Invisible things are our confidence on the basis of the effect of the, vis of the invisible thing. That's, that's the point. In John chapter 3, Jesus was having an, a conversation with Nicodemus, and he relayed the things of the Spirit to the wind. And the, the idea there is, have you ever seen the wind? Has anybody ever seen it? No. But you can see the effects of the wind here in Oklahoma, right? Right? If you're a lady, you go out into the wind, your hair is all over the place. It's not a good day to take a photo in Oklahoma. Would anybody argue that there was no wind? No. We know that there is. In fact, we're totally confident. Would you stake your life on there being wind here in Oklahoma? Would you be willing to say, I'd be willing to die? Um, I will stake my entire life on there being wind. I know there is. And they say, well, you've never seen it. But you'd say, but I have seen the effects of it. It does not matter that I have not seen God. I've seen the effects of God. It does not matter that I've not seen the Holy Spirit. I've seen the effects of the Holy Spirit. It's just a matter of what exactly he means by that. Let me give you another example. When we, we believe and accept by faith that the Holy Spirit lives inside of our vessel. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit Who's in you, whom you have from the Lord? Don't you know that your body is a temple of God's spirit? He lives in you? We'd say, yes, yes, amen. Well, um, take that. Let me ask a practical question. If somebody were living in your home unbeknownst to you, would you have an idea that someone was living in your home? After a while, maybe not immediately, but you might hear inexplicable noises from the attic. Or you might find food gone missing. Or you might find a light on that shouldn't be on. It, you may not have ever seen the person, but after a while you're going to start to think, I think somebody's living in here. As I typed this out, I felt like I was writing a horror script. The intention isn't to be scary this morning, but I, but I am making a point that someone could be alive in your house and you not having ever seen them would be aware of the effect of their presence to a degree. 
Now, if, if the Holy Spirit is alive in you, sometimes we get so wrapped up in these ultra-conservative circles that we just we don't even want to touch it. We say, he just sits in there. He doesn't do anything. If there's any heavy spiritual lifting that has to be done, it's going to be done by me. The exertion for, uh, for sanctification and holiness and being made righteous before God and producing the fruit that comes from the Holy Spirit, that's going to be by my willpower. But I do have great confidence in a spirit who's in me who I can't feel his presence and I've never seen him. Does that make any sense? No, but there are teachings that are surrounding that idea. <laughs> it's just unbelievable when you actually start to break open some of the arguments that the New Testament is making, which would be based on not having a conception of the Holy Spirit that he sits in your belly like Jonah in the whale and doesn't do anything all the way. And why, would he live, why would he come and live in you if his intention was to be in there and do nothing? Have you thought about that? Well, in, uh, in Romans 8, Paul is going to talk about, we're not going to go there yet. And I'm not even going to read a scripture. But in Romans 8, Paul is going to talk about something that the Holy Spirit's going to do for our body. Because he's in here on the day when Jesus comes back, there's something he's going to do for our body. All right? But here's what he does. So we don't have that yet. That's a part of, the, the, of our hope because it's not seen. But he does say this. He says, that's going to happen, but we do now have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Now, we've got some first fruits on our tree in our backyard right now. We planted it last spring. It's a little peach tree. Started off this high, and now it's, honestly, it's taller than I can reach in a year. We didn't expect any fruit, but the first fruits have appeared right now. We have four, we're going to get four uh, peaches this year. Not enough to make a cobbler, but we're seeing something. This tree's alive. Now, from my understanding, years like four, five, six and on, you can start to expect a big harvest. And there's going to be a tree full of peaches everywhere and we're going to be able to give some away and have some cobbler and do all that kind of stuff. But, but this year, we're, we're not there. We haven't seen that yet, but we do have the first fruits. That's what first fruits is. It is something you can experience and see right now that isn't the big harvest. And, and it's a sign of better days to come. It's a sign of something else ahead. And Paul later on, he says, you don't have the ultimate uh, uh, redemption and restoration and resurrection of your mortal body which is going to put on immortality so that you don't ever die but he does say you do have the first fruits of the spirit now what would that be the first indication Paul gave was in Romans chapter 2 when he says now listen very closely he says but a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. And therefore, his praise is not from man, but from God. What, according to Romans 2, is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer? Circumcision of the heart. The Jews circumcised the body, which means they, they took a part of the body which was associated with uncleanness and uh, being muddied and mixed in with, with the world, and they, they cut it off and removed it from themselves so that they could be set apart because God said, if you don't cut, cut off that, if you're not circumcised, you will be cut off from me. In other words, you be holy as I'm holy. Be set apart as I'm set apart. But now this is saying the Holy Spirit is what does that on your heart. In other words, there are things in your heart that are there that were part of the world that by way of the Holy Spirit are cut off and severed and removed. And therefore, he's making an argument on holiness. He's making an argument on being set apart and how the Holy Spirit's involved in that process. Let me give you an example of this. Matt Howe, and I have his, I have his uh, um, permission to read this text that he sent me, but... 
This is from uh, just after he was baptized a few weeks ago. I was checking in. I was saying, just how, how's things going and everything. And, you know, he came into these waters right here, and it was, I think it was like 115 degrees in there. Um, I don't know how hot it Jerry, did we ever measure it? It was hot. Those sins were washed away and burned to death. <laughs> they, it was very hot. I was glad I only had to go waist deep, but Matt went all the way under. And those sins were gone. Well, he got baptized, and he believed in Jesus and, and put him on in baptism. And I, I got with him that week. I said, how's it going? And this is what he said. It's been great. So relaxing, so stress-free. It's really crazy. Just the littlest things, like in my career field when we tend to cuss a lot, just out of bad habits. I've caught myself saying weird words instead of what I may have normally said before. And the most rewarding part is I feel whole. I'm eager to learn more and actually read a lot more into the scriptures you've shared with me. Just amazing. I got that text, and that's one of the things, you know, if you're doing the work of ministry, that's the kind of thing that lifts you up, and, and it's like that's what it's all about right there is, is changing lives and sanctifying souls and bringing people into a true relationship that makes a difference in their life. But I thought, you know, what is it? That, you know, he just went into these waters here by faith and then he went back to the career field and all of a sudden he's finding himself making weird replacements for cuss words. I thought, what in the world is it that would make somebody who, you know, all up to this point has been using certain language and now all of a sudden doesn't want to do it anymore? What do you think? Amen. Holy Spirit. I thought as I went through his text, I thought, I could pick out at least one, two, three, four, five, six of the aspects of the fruit of the Holy Spirit just in that text. Namely, joy. He said, it's been great. So relaxing, so stress-free. Peace. Kind of the same thing. Relaxing, stress-free. Patience. Goodness. Faithfulness. Self-control. We sing the song from Galatians chapter 5 that talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Paul said, I say to you, if you walk by the Spirit of God, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And for those that have had this experience in their life of the Holy Spirit, wherein they're no longer doing or saying or being or behaving in the way that they did prior to coming to Jesus Christ, there is a certainty and an assurance of the presence of God that says... I don't know where this came from or how exactly it is, but I'm not the same person that I was before. That is an evidence of the Holy Spirit within you. You don't see him, but his presence is totally real. Now, I want to close this morning with a challenge. <clears throat> you know, here's, again, here's Paul's argument. Hope doesn't disappoint us now. As you sit in your pew this morning, you should be totally certain that if that roof were lifted off and you could see and behold the eyes of Jesus Christ, you should be confident to a spirit of almost boastfulness. We boast in our hope of the glory of God. You should be confident and certain that if that roof were lifted off, you'd be going into the presence of the Father. That is what the New Testament calls us to. But I'm almost certain, I would almost stake my life on it, that there will be people in here that are questioning right now the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And that questioning is exactly what God does want for you to be doing. Let me give you a reason for why. In 2 Corinthians 13, Paul says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. So, so you're sitting there and you think I'm in the faith. He says, examine yourselves. Then he says, test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? What's his argument there? He's saying you ought to be able to stop and reflect and look on your life and say, 
Do I have any evidence of the Holy Spirit working in my life so that I'm a loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, self-controlled person? He says, examine yourselves. And uh, he says, or do you, have you forgotten that Jesus is in you? And then he says, unless, you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Now, when he's saying that you should test yourselves... You might come out on the other end with no indication of Jesus living in you. And Paul's point in, in making you analyze that is not to say that if you come out on the other end of the test and realize Jesus isn't in you, that that there is your sentence of condemnation. The reason why he's doing that is so that people would be quickened from slumbering and sleeping and spiritual apathy to wake up and say, wow, I've been forfeiting great things in front of me, living for garbage things right here. And by way of failing to meet this test, I need to get right. In Second Peter, Peter says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. Make it sure. Be sure of it. There are times in my life I was not sure. I was doing lots of things right, but I was also living like with that conscience thing of me that was just constantly bothering me. Wake up, conscience bothering me. Conscience, I couldn't sleep well. It was just like, it's always there. I wasn't, because of that, I wasn't sure. So some crucifixion had to take place. Some circumcision of the heart had to take place in order to be sure, but you should be sure. And um, if you come out not being sure, then what do you do? If you say, I don't think the Holy Spirit's in me. I don't see any indication of the fruit that he is to bear, which he promises. And what do you do? Well, the simplest answer is what is the context? You remember, keep it all in context. What is the context of Romans chapter 5 and having peace with God, access into the grace of God, hope of future glory, and a boastfulness within afflictions? What was the context of that according to Romans 5 verse 1? Therefore, having been justified by faith, go back to those principles of faith that we've been breaking open in um, uh, Romans chapter 4, namely the one that said faith believes that the way of God is better always than any other way. That is one of the keys to overcoming sin, is knowing I can't have sin and God. Therefore, I must choose between the two, but which one is better? I know that it's God. Faith believes God's way is always better. It's always better than sin, which for me in my life was one of the greatest means to crucifying the flesh was knowing that one thing. Crucify the flesh. Be circumcised in the heart by having a faith in God and the Holy Spirit will fill you and there will be a change. My desire this morning is that we would all have grace and that we would all have peace. As Jesus said, my will is that not one of these sheep would perish or be lost. Isn't that the will of the shepherds here? That not one of these sheep would be lost? Isn't that the will of brothers and sisters that not one would be lost? As I look out, I, I see a lot of sad faces. Um, it's not meant to be a sad lesson. This is, there is assurance of our future hope. But we have to get real church and we got to talk about sin. And we got to talk about, you know, there's this idea that goes around that says, I got my struggle, you got your struggle, and I'm going to have my struggle till the day I die. But that isn't the way that it is in the Bible. Yes, you have a struggle and a thing that may be a temptation, but the Bible says that there's a thing called sanctification, a crucifixion of the old way and the old order. God really does renew and restore. I'm certain because I'm not the same person I was in my college years. He does. And if we want to be there with him, we've got to let him. So let's be joyful. Let's test ourselves. 
And let's be filled with God's spirit. Let's sing.